chapter 33, is the interpretation of dental caries. You'll find this on page 403 in your book. So the learning objectives will be to define the key terms associated with the interpretation of dental caries. We need to be able to describe dental caries, and we want to do the following related to the detection of dental caries. So explain why caries appear radiolucent on a dental image. We're going to discuss the importance of dental caries in relation to the clinical examination, and we'll discuss the importance of dental caries in relation to the dental image examination. We will discuss the interpretation tips for evaluating caries on a dental image. We will discuss the factors that may influence the, dental Im the image interpretation of dental caries. And we also want to do the following related to classifying caries on dental images. So detail the classification of caries on dental images. On a dental image, identify and describe the appearance of the following, an incipient, a moderate, an advanced and a severe interproximal caries. On a dental image, identify and describe the appearance of the following, incipient, moderate, and severe occlusal caries. And on a dental image, identify and describe the appearance of the following, buccal, lingual, root surface, recurrent, and rampant caries. Also very important is that on a dental image, we need to be able to identify conditions that may be confused with dental caries. That include cervical burnout, restorative materials, attrition, and abrasion. All right, so why are we doing this, right? We don't just diagnose cavities, so why do we need to know what they look like, right? Well. We're that second pair of eyeballs. We need to be able to describe those dental caries and the caries detection, uh, it, the way that we go about detecting that cavity, right? We need to present those interpretation tips and factors that influence caries interpretation. So we need to understand how to go about finding cavities. And we need to introduce the classification of caries on dental images. So while I know you guys were in preclinic and you've already been exposed to the classification of caries, uh, we're going to talk about it in relation to our dental radiographs. So the definition of a caries is the localized destruction of teeth by microorganisms. This is also called a cavity. Um, and caries, the word caries, it comes from the Latin word uh, cariosis, which means rotting. And it literally means the rotting of the teeth. So the teeth are rotting out. A carious lesion or an area of tooth decay is also called a cavity. Um, in dentistry, cavity uh, refers to that cavitation or the hole that's in the tooth that is basically formed by that microorganism um, assault. This is just an example of what a cavity might look like. Uh, this is one type. This is an occlusal cavity, which is very easy to see. Um, and it, I mean, it looks, it's just this little spot right here. You could stick an explorer down in there, right? That is what a cavity or a caries looks like. So there's two ways to detect caries. There is both the clinical examination and the dental image examination. And both of them need to go hand in hand together in order to be able to accurately identify cavities. The clinical exam and the dental images are both necessary to identify caries. A dental image enables the dental professional to identify caries lesions that are not visible clinically, right? So if we couldn't see it with the naked eye, we're able to see it on our radiographs. But also, they're able to tell us, even if we could see it with our eyeballs, the radiographs will tell us the extent or the severity of that carious lesion. So we might see a cavity and think, oh yeah, that's pretty small. But then when we see it on the radiograph, it actually tells us, oh no, it's actually, it's much larger than we originally thought. And so radiographs are a, an absolutely essential component of detecting cavities. So in that, um, clinical examination, being able to look at them. Some cavities we can see just by looking in the mouth. We can tell that it's a cavity, but not all of them, 
Okay. Uh, the mirror can be used to reflect light or allow for indirect vision and retract the tongue. Remember, we can also use our mirror for trans illumination, where we kind of shine that beam through the teeth to see if there's any dark areas in, uh, on the insides of any of the teeth. We do that mainly for the anterior teeth, right? Because posterior teeth are a little bit too, too, uh, too wide. Uh, we can also use our explorer to detect changes in consistency in pits, grooves, and fissures. So when we go around with our shepherd's hook, and we're feeling the surface of the tooth, we're feeling that it's all strong and it's intact enamel, right? We're not able to puncture or stick into the enamel at all because enamel doesn't allow us to do that. So if we were going around with our explorer and we had a little area that was soft or it was like, um, most of the time I refer to it as a stick, it sticks into the enamel then that would indicate that that enamel is no longer intact. It's been weakened somehow, right? And that it, it could very well be a cavity. And so uh, we, use, we use the clinical examination of that, but also color too. So the color, like we saw in that image right before, the uh, the color can sometimes change. Now, does it always? No. Sometimes the tooth looks perfectly intact and yet it has a cavity on it, okay? Um, but sometimes the occlusal surface will show kind of like a dark stain in the fissure, the pit, or the groove. Uh, sometimes the smooth surface will have a chalky white spot or an opacity. And sometimes the interproximal ridge may appear discolored. So in that last one, you could see kind of like a, a darkness underneath the tooth surface, right? That is what indicated that, that it has a carious lesion. So like we said, sometimes some of the teeth may exhibit that discolored area or the cavitation, or it could have no changes. There could be no visible indication that there is a cavity. And it, uh, if we're looking in between the teeth, there is actually much more difficult to be able to tell clinically. So that is where our radiographs really come into play, is looking in between the teeth. Um, that caries that occur in between teeth can be very difficult or even impossible to detect clinically. So we have to have radiographs. Um, I've worked in a lot of places where, um, you know, sometimes patients say, well, uh, just look in there and if you see anything that's suspicious, then I'll take an x-ray. I don't want to take x-rays unless you see something. And that's not how it works. Okay, so this next section, this could be on your boards. A cavity, when we see it on a radiograph, the carious lesion will appear radiolucent because it is not as dense as the enamel around it. The enamel has actually demineralized. So when it demineralizes, the cavity forms by demineralizing the enamel, it becomes less dense. And when it's less dense, as we know in all of our other class, all of the other chapters, when it's less dense, it shows up more radiolucent. The x-rays are able to penetrate that area and get to the sensor easier, right? So if there's a cavity, it means the enamel is not intact, it's demineralized, and it's not as dense as the enamel around it. The bite wing image is the best image for looking for uh, cavities, interproximal cavities especially, right? Um, a periapical image, when it's taken with the paralleling technique, is also pretty good. It's not quite as good because of the, the amount, the angle, right, that we have to sometimes use in order to take this image. So it's not as good, um, but it is, we can still see uh, carries on periapical images. Don't think that we can't see them at all. We can, but the bite wing is the best, okay? Okay, so we're going to talk about each of these, the interpretation tips and the factors that influence those carries. Okay, so your book talks about interpretation tips. First up is proper mounting, okay? Whether you're using film or digital, you need to properly mount your images. Excuse me, you need to properly mount those radiographs. Um, they need to be where they're supposed to be because you, if you have, you know, uh, a mandibular molar in the place where the maxillary molar is, you see a little area on the uh, mandibular, or you, uh, you see a little area on the maxillary molar for the bite wing, but then when you look at the PA, it looks like it's totally intact because it's not even the same tooth. And then you think that there's no cavity on that tooth, right? So that's, you, you have to have to have all of the images 
in the places where they're supposed to be so that you can kind of double check yourself. You see a little radiolucency there. Let me look at this PA. Yep, that radiolucency is there too. It's a cavity. Um, obviously, that's what you're thinking inside your mind, right? You're not going to say the word cavity. We talked about that last week. Then um, the rest of these, the viewing, the illuminator, the masking light, the pocket size magnifying glass, those are all if you're using film. So if you're using film, you're going to have to put it on a view box, right, to be able to shine light through those radiographs and to be able to see them really well. Um, it's better if you kind of view it in a room that's not very bright. It's not a lot going on. So yes, your patient might be there, but it's just the two of you, okay? You don't want to be... Um, in like the the up you don't want to be up front or having a, a whole lot of distractions going on because then you might miss something and then the illuminator box obviously is more for film you're not using that with a computer the masking light is it's kind of think about like if you turn the brightness up really high on your phone and you're trying to look at something really small and also kind of light you're gonna have a hard time seeing it right so you might change yourself over to either uh, lower brightness or you might even change over to like that dark mode on your phone now um, and you're able to see whatever it is you're looking at a lot better right because if you have a lot of extra light shining into your eyes your eyes will uh, your pupil you know um, it closes or you know goes down to that pinpoint size and you're not able to see as good and then a pocket size magnifying glass is what you'd use for film obviously if you're using digital you're just gonna enlarge the image of course Another major, major factor for uh, being able to interpret these images is if they are diagnostic, right? So first of all, we need to have open contacts, okay? We cannot see in proximal areas when the contacts are overlapped like this, okay? There's no way, there's no way to see in between the teeth if we are looking at this giant white blob instead. And then the other factor is your proper contrast and density, right? So um, on your digital sensor with your digital image you're able to change this a little bit but with film you're not able to change it you'd have to retake this image um, with the first one over here with this horizontal angulation you got to retake that no matter what that that's a horrible image um, I mean you might open some of these contacts but you're not going to open all these contacts with your molar bite wing so you, you got to retake that one um, but it's it's very important that you get a diagnostic image and, and diagnostic just means can I diagnose cavities from this image all right, next up is going to be the classification of those caries. Um, so we're going to talk about interproximal, we're going to talk about occlusal, we'll talk about buccal and lingual, we'll talk about root surface, we'll talk about recurrent, and we'll talk about rampant caries. All of these are caries. Okay, so it, first up is interproximal caries. Interproximal meaning between teeth. So it's in between two adjacent surfaces. Two teeth have to reach out and touch one another in order for this to be interproximal caries. They're typically seen on dental images at or just below the contact point. This is very important. At or just below the contact point. So I'm going to draw a tooth here. I'm going to draw another tooth here. Don't worry about these. And then so this point, this point right here where they touch each other, the cat, the cavity is going to form right here, or it's going to form right here below it. It is not going to be down here. Okay, that is not where cavities form. So, cavity, an interproximal cavity, is going to form by a little triangular configuration. It's going to look like this, this little area here, right? And then we have, you know, our enamel is this little section right here, and then obviously we have our, you know, our pulp horn. So we've got our little tooth inside, right? So first up is this little triangle right here. And then once it gets in here, it's going to form another triangle like that. This area here is cavity. Let me try to color this in. This is, this is rough. Okay. And then this little area here, that area. Okay. That's a cavity right there. It forms in little triangles. When it reaches the DEJ, it spreads laterally and progresses through the dentin. So this is the dentin, right? And then in here, I have my, this is my, my nerve or my root canal or the root canal. This is, this is the pulp chamber. Pulp chamber. So anyway, it's going to form a little triangle as it burrows its way through. But this enamel on the inside here is very dense. So it starts out kind of big, all the bacteria is like trying to get through. And then as it gets deeper and deeper, all the bacteria like figure out what the heck they're doing and they, they come together and they form together and they pop 
pop through the uh, enamel. They get to the dentin and then they spread out real, really nicely, right? They're all trying to figure out what's the path of least resistance. But then the one in the middle usually figures it out. And so they all kind of converge again. And they find that this, in fact, is the path of least resistance right here in the middle. So then they come through and then they get to this pulp chamber. And this is where they want to be. This is, there's like no resistance in here. They can just spread and proliferate and, and eat all of the tissue. They have no problems with this area. Um, once they get into the DJ, they spread laterally and progress through the dentin. These are classified as incipient, moderate, advanced, and severe, okay? And we're gonna talk about each one of these. Each of these little stages as they get through, that is going to determine the classification of that caries. Okay, so there's a lot going on in this image, right? But when we're looking for interproximal caries, then we're looking here to see in between these teeth. Right here, right below this contact point, can you see this giant area right here, this radiolucency? That is the cavity that's formed here. We're not getting confused by the fact that this is all amalgam, right? That's all amalgam filling material. We're not getting confused by the fact that there's all this bone loss down here. We're not getting confused by all these things, okay? We're just looking for cavities this time around. And remember when we talked about, you know, you're going to click through all of your images more than one time, and each time you're looking for very specific things. So, you know, the first time you clicked through, you were looking for the fact that, you know, maybe 16 and 17 are both missing right? The second time you looked through, you, you charted all these restorations. Well, now this is the third time you've clicked through, and now this time you're looking for this. You're looking for this little radiolucency right here. Here it again is, again, the interproximal caries, and this time we're seeing this little spot right here. Well, obviously there's an arrow, so let me just get rid of this red line. So you see that little arrow pointing to the, the dark spot? That is an interproximal caries, but you can tell, see how it's not all the way through the enamel right there? It's not to the DEJ just yet. Here's the DEJ. That's a good thing. That's a good sign. We're looking to see how far it has progressed. Has it reached the DEJ yet? And uh, again, as well, it's right below the contact, right? We're right here. Here's the contact of these teeth. The, the cavity's not forming down here by the bone, right? It's forming up here at or right below where that contact point is. Okay, so first up is the incipient caries. Remember we were just talking about uh, where the cavity is in relation to the DEJ, right? So if it's only halfway or less than halfway through the enamel, right? If we cut the enamel, <laughs> that's my dog sighing, she's over this. So if we cut our enamel right in half, then if our cavity doesn't extend more than halfway, then it's a class one or an incipient caries. Okay, this is very important. An incipient caries can be reversed with fluoride, okay? Once it passes that halfway point, it can no longer be remineralized with fluoride. Now it must be filled. So it's very important when we're looking for incipient caries that we're talking to our patients about the importance of being able to remineralize areas like this, okay? Okay, so next up is the moderate interproximal caries. And this one extends more than halfway, but does not touch, does not touch the DEJ. Okay, once it touches the DEJ, it's not a moderate caries anymore, okay? So this cavity, you can see it's more than halfway, but it's not touching the DEJ. And this one is a class two lesion. It is a moderate or a class two interproximal caries. This is very important to classify our caries lesions. This cavity right here, will not spread as quickly as one that has broken the DEJ because de enamel is, is much more dense, right? Dentin is not as dense. And so cavities, once they reach the dentin, they spread like wildfire, okay? But before they get to the dentin, they are much more slow growing. However, because we're past halfway, we cannot cure this with fluoride. We cannot reverse this. We cannot remineralize this. This must be filled with a cat with a with a filling with you know the dentist drilling out this cavity area and filling this in with a uh, restorative material okay so this one is an advanced interproximal caries okay so this is what happens once the cavity breaks this DEJ just like I said before this dentin is not as dense and so it advances quickly it it grows fast okay you can see here on this image this, this, um, it's on the distal aspect here of number 14. 
that the cavity has broken through here and the cavity has broken through here on the distal of 19. But here, see here on the, the distal of uh, number 20, actually we haven't broken through the DEJ yet. This is still a, um, a class two lesion here on the distal of number 20. But the distal of 19, this one has broken through the DEJ. And so it is now an advanced interproximal caries. It's going to spread and it's going to grow very, very quickly, okay? So a class three or an advanced lesion affects both the enamel and the dentin. Once it punctures the dentin, it is now a class three or advanced interproximal caries. Okay, so then this next, the next obviously next step is severe interproximal caries. A severe interproximal caries extends through the enamel and the dentin and more than half the distance toward the pulp, okay? So this little line, the pulp, if I'm sorry, the dentin, if we were to break it in half, the severe interproximal carry would pass halfway through the dentin, and it's, uh, it's more than halfway toward the pulp chamber, okay? So this is very important. How far it's traveled through the dentin toward the pulp is going to to tell us a lot, okay? On this radiograph here, we can see it's on number 30's distal, and it's nice because it, actually it's written down for us. So um, here, this little line right here, this area, this darkness, see how it's more than halfway toward the pulp? That tells us it's a severe interproximal caries. This is also considered a class four lesion. Um, we don't diagnose, right? So even if you saw a cavity like this, you are not allowed to say, oh yeah, you have a cavity, right? You are allowed to say there appears to be a suspicious lesion. Do you see this large radiolucency right here, right? You're allowed to say things like that, but you're not allowed to say this is a cavity. The worst possible thing that you could say here is that this patient needs a root canal or that they need a filling, okay? You should not say that they need anything specific. You might say, um, you know, the dentist will talk to you about uh, maybe treatment in this area, but the worst thing you can say is, oh yeah, you're probably gonna need a filling, right? Because what if the dentist comes in and says, um, you know, you need a root canal and a crown? right? You've gone from maybe a $300 service to a $2,000 service or a $3,000 service, depending on who you go to for that root canal. And your patient is going to be very, very upset with you, okay? Because as soon as they hear that they have a cavity, they want to know how much it costs, okay? So be very, very careful when you're using words to describe these areas. So while you know there's a good chance they need a root canal, we don't tell them that they need a root canal, okay? You could, I mean, you could explain the root canal process and say, you know, um, let me talk to you about the difference between uh, fillings and crowns and root canals and things like that. You're, you're allowed to talk to them about the services provided that are optional, but you're not allowed to tell them what they need, okay? Be very careful in that. You do not diagnose. Okay, so occlusal caries are the next step. And occlusal caries are ones that involve the chewing surface, just like they you would think they would, right? They literally tell you where they're at. So a it's it's uh, it's going to be the chewing surface of the posterior teeth, by the way, right? We know that the uh, chewing surface of the anterior teeth isn't really a chewing surface. It's kind of like a biting shearing surface. It's the incisal. Anyway, um, a thorough clinical exam is the method of choice for the detection of clinical caries. So here we need to be very specific about going around with that shepherd hook explorer and your dentist needs, to, well, it's more so the dentist needs to be very specific about going around with that shepherd hook explorer and feeling each of those occlusal surfaces. Early occlusal caries are difficult and sometimes even impossible to see on a dental image, okay? So when they're small, especially if they're incipient, um, even the class two sometimes are really, really, really hard to see on a dental image because, again, three-dimensional object in a two-dimensional picture. So when we're looking across the occlusal surface, there's a lot of enamel there. We're looking across all of the enamel. And so it's very dense. Uh, even if the cavity is right in the middle, the outside is dense and the inside is dense. And so, um, you know, you're going to have a very difficult time seeing that. So just like we said, incipient occlusal caries cannot be seen on a dental image. They have to be found with an explorer. 
So moderate occlusal caries, now these are not the same as before, right? Moderate occlusal caries extend into dentin. These are occlusal caries. They have their own classification system. So moderate occlusal caries extend down into the dentin. Once they reach the dentin, then we can start to see them as a thin, very thin radiolucent line on our dental images. So a severe occlusal caries is extended into the dentin and appears as a radiolucency. The radiolucency extends under the enamel of the occlusal surface of the tooth. So you can see here this is a pretty big radiolucent area right here under the, the enamel. And so we can definitely tell something's going on right here. They've got something going on up here too, but we're not really worried about that. That's probably not an occlusal caries. That's, that's probably a chip tooth or um, yeah, a whole section of the tooth that has sheared off. We're thinking down here on number uh, 31, right? Because 30 is missing. So 31 is this area where there's I mean, there's probably a, a big old cavity right there on the occlusal surface. Probably, right? Because I don't know, I'm not a dentist. Uh, so buccal and lingual caries are really, really difficult, extremely difficult to detect on a dental image because they're superimposed on the tooth structure. So you know how we talk about how, you know, if we overlap our, our uh, two teeth will have a superimposed structure over another one. Well, a buccal or a lingual cavity is going to be superimposed. It's a three-dimensional object, right? So there's a lot of distance from the the you know x outside surface to the inside surface, the buccal to the lingual here. There's a there's a lot of thickness, and so if the arrow is pointing at this area. This is going to be very very hard to detect, and it's I mean you you may or you may not detect it and that's that's okay it's not your job to detect it it's your job to notice it if if you see it and to point it out if you see it uh, but that's probably the nicest thing about being a hygienist is that um you know we're not we're not 100 percent responsible for finding every single thing um, now these these areas are going to be really difficult to see on a radiograph but when you look inside their mouth you're going to see this area, okay? Don't think that you're, you'll miss it just because you don't look at your x-rays hard enough. Um, you'll catch it when you look inside the mouth, okay? So be aware of that. Root surface caries, now typically these will form more so if there is recession. You can see here in this image or in this in this drawing that the root surface is actually exposed to the oral cavity. And when it is exposed, it's not covered up by gingiva, then it's more likely to, uh, it's, it's more likely to get a root surface caries. So patients, older patients, especially as their tissue recedes, um, they're more likely and they're more at risk for getting um, root caries. That's how I always, I, at least in my mind, it's always root caries or root cavities um, around, which uh, obviously, and they involve the root of the tooth. So because there's no dent, or I'm sorry, there's no enamel covering up this dentin surface, the cavity actually reaches the root surface or the dentin surface really easy, right? It's, it's, I mean, it's, there's not a lot of stuff in the way. Now there is cementum here, but cementum is not more radiodense than dentin. It's actually less dense than dentin. It's, it's only there to, to you know, as the serve as an attachment site for the Sharpie's fibers in, in the PDL. So um, it's, it's really not, the best thing. So it, it really doesn't protect the dentin at all. Um, and so be aware that if the if the root is exposed to the mouth, that patient runs the risk of getting a cavity on the root much easier. On a dental image, it appears as a cupped out or crater shaped radiolucency below the CEJ. An early lesion can be difficult to detect on a dental image when it's really small, right? Because there's this thing called cervical burnout. We'll talk about it in a bit, but it can be really difficult to detect a root surface cavity on a radiograph. Now, if the root surface is exposed in the mouth, you'll be able to tell because you're gonna you're gonna look in their mouth too, right? So it, keep that in mind that sometimes it can be difficult to tell radiographically with a root surface if it's small. If it's big, you're definitely gonna see it. You're gonna you're gonna see this, right? But if it's small, you're gonna have to look in the mouth to find it. Okay, so recurrent caries are a cavity that occurs adjacent to an existing restoration. Okay, uh, it appears as a radiolucent area just beneath a restoration. It's often located beneath the interproximal regions 
of a restoration. So what happens is the dentist places a filling, and as you can see here, this is not the best amalgam filling in the world, right? It, it has an overhang, okay? We talked about this when we in the last chapter where we talked about overhangs being very, very detrimental to the health of our patients. Um, and so there's an overhang here, and it causes bacteria to build up in this interproximal space here, and it eats through underneath here, and it causes a cavity underneath that filling. Now, this doesn't happen every time, okay? Sometimes um, there's this thing called micro leakage, you know, how things expand and contract based on temperature, right? So, like, things get hot, they expand, things get cold, they contract. Um, your mouth works the same way. You put a lot of different temperatures in there all the time, right? Like, I like iced coffee as much as I like hot coffee. So, I... I put a lot of different temperatures in, into you know, my oral cavity, and because of that, things expand and contract. And you're, you're going to learn about this a lot in dental materials, but not all dental materials expand and contract the same amount as tooth structure does. So an amalgam being one of the most common, but it doesn't expand and contract the same way that tooth structure does. So over time, there's this little bit of a separation between the tooth and the, the restoration. And it's called micro leakage, where basically their bacteria and moisture and things like that get down in around that restoration because it's normal wear and tear. It's normal to, you know, drink hot coffee and iced coffee. That's normal. So um, sometimes we see that recurrent caries, even if the restoration was placed perfectly. If there was absolutely nothing that could have been improved upon with that restoration, it's it's a wonderful one. It can still get a cavity around it through micro leakage. This is the reason why most of the time um, restorations are only meant to last. 10 years. Uh, 10 years is kind of the, the average for a restoration. You're expected to replace almost all of your restorations uh, every 10 years. If you get 10 years out of it, you got a good life out of that restoration. Um, if you're hard on it, you grind your teeth, you you know, you know are, are wearing them down really fast, you might only get five. If you're really careful with it, you never grind your teeth, you only drink uh, cold coffee, then you might get 15 years out of it. And that's wonderful. Good for you. But the life of a restoration is usually around 10, and it's when things start to break down is when you can get this recurrent caries around that restoration. And so that is what it looks like on a radiograph. There is a filling right there, and then right next to the filling, usually it's underneath, and it kind of comes in from the interproximal space, there is a radiolucency. Um, if there is an overhang, you're not gonna get 10 years out of that restoration, okay? If there's an overhang, you're probably gonna lose bone around it. You're gonna you're gonna get a recurrent carry very quickly. And so keep that in mind. If you see restorations, you automatically know we need to watch this restoration because it's gonna have problems. Okay, next up is rampant caries. Rampant caries are advanced and severe caries that affect a number of teeth, okay? So we're looking at not just one cavity, but many, many cavities. Um, it makes me sick thinking about this, but it's, it's associated with children with poor diets and adults with decreased salivary flow. So people who don't always have control over their diet and people who don't have control, they're vulnerable, they're at risk populations like children and older adults or adults with some type of, of disorder or uh, a medication that they take that's going to cause this decreased salivary flow. Um, people who are at risk, who have these, these um, types of things, they are more likely to get rampant caries. Um, Rampant caries are painful. Um, to get a cavity and, and to have it travel to the pulp canal and travel down the nerve and, and to cause an abscess, that is, that is what people talk about when they have a toothache, right? They're, they're, they either they fractured it and it's causing an abscess or they have a cavity and it's causing an abscess. Um, that is, those are the people who get a toothache. And so, um, it's kind of like the soft spot in my, in, in, you know, in my practice is children with poor diets who get rampant caries and adults with, uh, with it, 
decreased salivary flow, but also adults, older adults who don't get to control what they eat, uh, people who are at risk. Um, they they need advocacy from us, but that's another another day. Um, on, a, on an x-ray, on a radiograph, we're looking for multiple severe or advanced caries affecting a number of teeth. Okay, so we talked about this a little bit, but we're going to talk about each one of these. And each one of these are conditions that can sometimes be confused with um, cavities, right? The number one is cervical burnout. I distinctly remember being a hygiene student and seeing a th what I thought was a cavity and, and marking them down everywhere. And then I, you know, just because I was concerned and I, you know, was worried about what was going on with my patient, I wasn't sure how to approach uh, even dental hygiene treatment. So I go to one of my instructors and I can, I can still see her face. <laughs> um, she was super kind about it, but she was like, no, this is not a cavity. None of these are cavities. These are all cervical burnout. Like, go away. <laughs> I was just like, oh, very well. Um, the other things that we might see are going to be restorative materials, which we talked about in the last chapter as far as those composites that are not as radiodense. Um, and also attrition and abrasion can sometimes uh, confuse us for cavities. Okay, cervical burnout. Cervical burnout is a radiolucent artifact that's seen on dental images. It's going to appear as a collar-shaped or wedge-shaped area between the CEJ and the alveolar bone. It can appear as ill-defined wedge-shaped radiolucencies on the mesial or the distal root surfaces near the CEJ of posterior teeth too. So what does that mean, right? Um, so 409 is the first image that we really see of it, the 33-26, the collar-shaped cervical burnout seen on on anterior teeth. Um, I don't like that image as much. So if you turn the page to 410, um, figure 33-27A is where we see it on posterior teeth. And you can see those little arrows pointing to those areas around the teeth, right? Those kind of look like cavities, right? They're wedge shaped, right? They're actually the wrong direction triangle, right? Which we talked about, but um, they can kind of look like that. And the reason for that is the tissue around this area. So in the from the CEJ towards the occlusal, there is enamel that completely surrounds the tooth, right? And then from the bone level down, there is bone that completely surrounds the tooth. But the area between the CEJ and the bone, there's nothing around that tooth that's you know, causing the, the x-rays to not be able to penetrate whatever it is. So it's actually able to penetrate those areas a little bit easier. And so it shows up like this. This is, it's cervical burnout because remember, we have to remember that our tooth is actually three-dimensional, right? So it's, it's the, the thickness around it, but also the enamel covers the, the surface that we're looking at and the surface away, so it's thicker, it's three-dimensional. And the area there, it does, it's just not as dense um, in, in, on the third dimension, the depth that we're looking at, it's not as dense. So that is why there is cervical burnout. Just try to remember that unless the cavity is at or just below the contact area, I wouldn't mark it down as a cavity if I were you, unless you were like 100% sure and you had ruled out cervical burnout. Oh good, so we're looking at it here. So here, here's that anterior image. You can see this area is covered by bone, right? So it's really dense up here and it's dense over here and that's great. And then this area right here, this is all covered by enamel, right? That's what our enamel sh is shaped like, right? But this area in the middle, this is not covered by enamel and it's not covered by bone. So because again, it's not as thick here on the side, right here in the middle, it's, it's thicker because it's a three-dimensional object, but on the side, it's not as dense. So you get these little triangles, these little areas called cervical burnout, where that might appear like cavities, but they're not because it's just not, there's just not as much structure. There's not as much dense stuff happening in that area. So it looks a little bit more radiolucent. Uh, yes, so here is the image that I was talking about on page 410. This one is really nice. So 
it, it shows you a wonderful example of cervical burnout where you can see here is the end of the enamel right here. This is where the enamel ends. Well, uh, it probably ends like right here. Okay, and then this is where the bone level sits, right? The bone level comes across, it comes up, it comes back across, right there, that's the bone. So then this area here, this is cervical burnout because it's not being covered by this enamel right here. Well, the enamel is probably more like, like that. And then it's not being covered by bone and it's a little less thick on the side than it is in the middle. This is the middle, it's more thick, it's, you know, it's, it's a, deeper structure there in the middle. And so this structure on the side here, that is cervical burnout. Remember we talked about cavities and how they, they form, um, they'll form right here, right below the contact or right at the contact, okay? If your cavity is forming right above the bone level, you should be suspicious, okay? It's probably cervical burnout. Oh, this is a good example too of looking at it from the top over here on B. You can see that it's not as dense. See how it's not as dense right here? But then here in the middle, obviously it's much more dense and then over here, not as dense. So that is why it looks like that. Okay, restorative materials like composites, silicates, and acrylics, which we already talked about in the last chapter, those have, uh, well, most of the time they're in the anterior cavity preparation is restored with those materials because they're not as dense as, as the posterior ones. Um, and so from the appearance of interproximal cavities, they can be identified as well-defined, smooth outline. Remember we talked about in that last chapter, they have this perfect sort of like a, a rounded shape to them, which tells us cavities don't form like that. And we probably should look in the mouth to see if there's a, a restorative material there, right? Um, so a careful, clinical examination will also help us to determine because we look in their mouth and we see that there's actually composite material there. All right, and it looks like this. Now, remember, I've told you that cavities form in the shape of triangles, right? Not squares, not circles, okay? No semicircles here. They're, they form in triangles. So keep in mind when we're looking at, at restorative material, when we're looking at interproximal areas, if, it, if it's a semicircle or if it's a... a a square, then it's it's probably not a cavity. It's probably a already prepped area that a dentist has shaped out and, excuse me, made to look like this. Okay, so next up is attrition. And I feel like you've probably heard a little bit about this in your preclinic class. If not, this is the first time you're being exposed to this. Attrition is when people grind their teeth. And when they grind their teeth, they literally wear away the tip surface of the tooth. Either it's a cusp, it's the occlusal or the incisal edge. They're wearing down that chewing surface of the tooth. And so um, when they do that, they wear away the enamel from the top, right? And once they wear the enamel on the top away, then the dentin is exposed. And so sometimes when we see this, we don't see any enamel. We see a kind of radiolucent ish area and we assume oh maybe that's a cavity right it's not necessarily so it can be a scene on the incisal the occlusal surfaces of deciduous or permanent teeth deciduous meaning baby teeth right deciduous because they fall out so deciduous or permanent teeth can both have attrition on them. When the incisor or the occlusal and animal is worn away, the underlying dentin wears away rapidly, and sometimes even little concavities can form. Um, in a clinical examination, it's going to be very important that you feel that structure very gently with your explorer, and you're going to tell that it's not soft. A dentin, while it's not as dense as enamel, is it's still pretty dense, okay? You're not gonna be able to puncture it very easily. So as long as you're using the right amount of pressure there, you're not gonna harm it. And so you're gonna feel that surface with the tip of your explorer, um, and you're gonna tell, okay, this is a very hard tissue, and it's not a cavity. Um, so sometimes on a radiograph, you'll see it, but also you're gonna need to, to take kind of extra close look at it with your uh, clinical examination as well. This is what that looks like. It's got this kind of scooped out area that might f seem like a cavity, um, but because the uh, because the enamel is gone from up here, the dentin wears away a little bit. Um, um, this is also sometimes called acid erosion, not just attrition. Attrition is when they grind and they wear the top surface down. Erosion is like the the wearing of the 
the dentin layer away through like acid or through um, through some sort of chemical means. But anyway, attrition here can sometimes be confused with cavities and uh, don't do that. Abrasion is one of the other um, sort of wearing away of two structures um, methods. And so this is from the friction of a foreign object. Um, most of the time you'll see it as toothbrush abrasion, right? Because people used to use hard and medium uh, toothbrushes and even some people with soft toothbrushes, they go to town in there and they end up wearing away tooth structure with their toothbrush, which while totally normal to us is considered a foreign object. It doesn't grow in their mouth, wish it did. Um, the surface of the tooth is affected depends on the causative factor. So it depends on, you know, where they're brushing too hard or, um, you know, how they're holding the toothbrush or what kind of toothbrush they have, things like that. The most frequent type is the caused by improper toothbrushing, which um, I, you guys might learn this term. I know for sure you'll learn it in term four, but uh, the scrub method of toothbrushing is the reason why most people have toothbrush abrasion. Um, clinically, the areas affected by abrasion appear as hard, highly polished defects in dentin and should not be confused with root caries because um, they appear uh, root caries that appear brown and leathery. Um, it, toothbrush abrasion it will sometimes form this thing called an ab fraction. Um, we'll get into it all later, but just don't don't confuse these areas with cavities, okay? So if you feel it with your explorer and it feels nice and hard, um, then it's not a cavity. So this is what that looks like on a radiograph, that abrasion, that person is going to town, scrubbing their teeth back and forth. Um, and so, don't, don't confuse this with a cavity. All right, that's the end of this. If you have questions, please let me know.